Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, and on behalf of Jewish Funders Network, I want to welcome you to today's program on how not to think about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. At today's program that is offered in partnership with Sapir, a journal of Jewish conversations, we will explore the perils of looking at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict through a purely Western lens, particularly in the media and on college campuses. And before I introduce Felicia Herman, who's the Chief Operating Officer of Maimonides Fund and the Managing Editor of Sapir, I wanted to let um, all of you know that current JFN members are eligible to receive a free hard copy of the upcoming issue of Sapir, um, which will come out in November. And I will put a form in the, in the chat for you to fill out and claim your copy. And with that, I want to introduce Felicia Herman, who he said before is the Chief, Chief Operating Officer of Maimonides Fund and the Managing Editor of Sapir, a journal of Jewish conversations. Um, and Felicia will moderate today's conversation and help us get started by framing by framing the program. Thank you, Felicia. Thanks, Tamar. Um, and speaking on behalf of the whole Sapir team, we're really grateful to JFN for hosting today's event, which is hopefully the first of many ways that we'll be working together. I know that Andres Spicoini, who's the head of JFN, has said many times that one of the things we need more of in the Jewish world is more venues for ideas um, and discussion. So um, that is what we're trying to do with Sapir. So I'm hoping um, that many of you know that Sapir launched this spring as a project of the Maimonides Fund. And I have been really honored to serve as managing editor alongside Brett Stevens, our editor in chief since then, um, together with our publishers, Mark Cherendoff and Ariela Saperstein. Our tagline for Sapir, as Tamar mentioned, is that it's a journal of Jewish conversations. The articles that we publish and the events that we host around them serve, we hope, as catalysts for many kinds of conversations. Our first issue was about social justice and actually catalyzed conversations even before it came out, which was really interesting. Um, and our second issue, which came out over the summer, uh, was about power. We're working on the third one right now, as Tamar mentioned, which is about continuity. And the fourth one um, we are just getting started on will be about aspiration. Um, if you want to receive a hard, everything's available online, but the hard copies are really beautiful. So we encourage people to sign up to get them. Um, we have been hosting online events um, since the first issue came out this spring, and actually Inat did a really brilliant event with Brett Stevens um, that's available on our website, like all of the events, um, right when all of the um, tumult was happening um, with Gaza, and that proved her piece and that conversation proved really timely. Um, and all of those, also all of those uh, events are available as podcasts um, on Apple Podcasts and whatever that line that you're supposed to say is all your favorite podcast platforms. Um, but today's the beginning of what we hope will be a really fruitful partnership with JFN to bring the ideas and the authors of Sapir into dialogue with Jewish communal leaders in ways that we feel like will be especially relevant and useful for funders. What, Sapir, what sets Sapir apart are two things. First, we're policy and solutions oriented. We're trying to be prescriptive and programmatic, not to tell people what to do, but actually to give them concrete ideas for ways that they might put into play the ideas that they're engaging with in Sapir. Um, because our, the second thing that sets us apart is that our primary audience is Jewish communal leadership, religious leadership, philanthropic leadership, educational. We really want to be able to offer powerful and useful ideas to people who can turn ideas into action, like all of you, like everyone on this call, um, in a way that's timely, challenging, and provocative. And I would maybe put a little bit of an emphasis also on provocative. Um, we are not afraid of poking holes in orthodoxies, small o, and bringing to light new and challenging perspectives. So today is super exciting for us because it's bringing these principles to life. Inat Wilf, whose brilliant piece appeared in our first issue, um, will be in conversation with two pioneering Jewish communal professionals, Leah Soibel and, Mar and Rabbi Mike Urim. And they'll talk practically about how and whether Inat's arguments and perspectives are playing out in their respective fields, all in a way that I feel is hyper relevant um, and front of mind for, Jewish for the Jewish philanthropic community. So let me introduce them so that I can then get out of the way. 
Dr. Inat Wilf uh, is the author of six books that explore key issues in Israeli society, most recently, The War of Return, How Western Indulgence of the Palestinian Dream Has, Obscure, has Obstructed the Path to Peace. She's a born and bred Israeli, a leading thinker on matters of foreign policy, economics, education, Israel, and Zionism. She was a member of the Knesset uh, from 2010 to 2013, representing both Labor and Ehud Barak's independence party. She's also served as an intelligence officer in the IDF as a foreign policy advisor to Vice Prime Minister Shimon Peres. Um, and she's currently uh, the Aaron and Cecile Goldman Visiting Israeli Professor in the Department of Government at Georgetown University. So we'll be excited to hear how her thinking is evolving um, through spending time on an American college campus. After Inat, we'll hear from Leah Soibel, who is the founder and CEO of Fuente Latina. She established Fuente Latina in 2012 because she recognized that there was a big gap in the Latino media market for factual information about Israel and the Middle East in Spanish and in real time. Fuente Latina's mission is to increase the understanding of Israel and the Middle East by Hispanics in the United States and Latin America by ensuring that Spanish language media can access the necessary data and sources before and during events that create, create news about Israel. And she has brought through this work millions of Spanish speakers an accurate image of Israel and the region um, through international media events, expert interviews and briefings, as well as in Israel itself. So she'll be speaking from her now tremendous experience about the ways that Israel and the conflict are covered both accurately and of course, very inaccurately um, in the media and in particular in Spanish language media. And last, but very much not least, uh, Rabbi Mike Urim uh, is now the Chief Vision and Education Officer for Pardes North America, but before that served as the Executive Director and Campus Rabbi at Penn Hillel for over 16 years. He has, he's the author of a best-selling book, Next Generation Judaism, How College Students and Hillel Can Help Reinvent Jewish Organizations, which won a National Jewish Book Award. And he has worked over his career with dozens of Jewish organizations, including foundations, federations, rabbinical groups, uh, Hillel International, local federations, synagogues, JCCs. So in other words, he has really vast and eclectic or diverse experience um, on campus and with so many different kinds of Jewish communal organizations in thinking through how to understand and talk about and educate people about Israel. Um, I will get out of the way. I'm gonna turn it over to Ainat. We're really grateful to all of the speakers for being here today, grateful to uh, our audience for being here today. And that is it, Ainat, take it away. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much for allowing me to be part of these Jewish conversations and to be able to write uh, this essay. So uh, this essay about how not to think about the conflict emerged from my experiences in the last decade, speaking to a whole variety of groups about Israel and Zionism and the conflict. Now, for many groups, uh, there was a genuine interest to understand, and I often saw them processing Israel and Zionism and the conflict through their own perspective. So African leaders uh, were fascinated by the tribal aspect of the Jewish identity. Chinese uh, officials were interested about the idea of Judaism actually as a secular civilizations. Uh, Indian leaders were interested about the idea of various nationalities and what it means to achieve self-determination. But especially coming to from the West, uh, many groups who came from the West, from Europe, from the US, from North America, uh, I sometimes saw a less genuine comparison made between Israel and the conflict and their perspective. And the most recent one uh, that I mentioned in the, in the essay was a young woman, a student who asked me at a talk how colorism uh, informs the conflict. It's the first time I heard that word. I understood what it means. I thought, I guess it was a nicer way to just not say racism about the conflict. And the talk at the time took place in Jaffa. And I told the young woman, I said, be my guest. You're welcome to come out here and see if you can tell apart Jews and Arabs living in Jaffa uh, by their skin tone. And the thing is, I was able to tell her, look, 
we are in conflict. Jews and Arabs in this land are in conflict. We are in conflict over many issues. None of them are skin tone. Uh, so it was very obvious that the perspective that she brought into this really had nothing to do with the conflict itself and an understanding of the conflict itself. And it is a process that I've seen over the years. I've seen it, of course, in the US when all of a sudden, not only were the words that were associated with Israel, apartheid and colonialism and racism, part of what I've long called the placard strategy, those equations on placards that equate Israel and Zionism and the Star of David with the world's greatest ills, uh, I realized that it began to even expand into the notion of Jews as being white. I remember when I first encountered that and I thought, when did that happen? Uh, clearly when white was an identity worth having, Jews were barred from that. Now that white is an identity not so worth having, now Jews are suddenly cast as white. Zionism suddenly as a movement of white supremacy. And all of that was so disjointed and connected from the experience in Israel and the conflict that I reflected on what drives it. And I realized that it's very similar to a couple of experiences I had in Ireland, Northern Ireland and South Africa. A few years ago, I visited Ireland and Northern Ireland. And I'm sure you know, for some reason, uh, very relevant now with uh, the author, Sally Rooney, um, Ireland, for some reason, decided that Israel is the British, the Palestinians are the Irish, and therefore they deeply identify with the Palestinians. If you go to Northern Ireland, to Belfast, on the Catholic side, you will see many, many Palestinian flags. And therefore, of course, the Protestants decided they're Israel, and on the Protestant side, you'll find some Israeli flags. And I remember visiting Ireland and Northern Ireland, and in the conversations, including with senior members of government and parliament, I suddenly realized that they knew nothing. They were incredibly passionate, using, of course, terms like genocide. One member of parliament from Sinn Féin talked about the genocide that Israel is committing. So they were very passionate using the harshest terms, but it was clear that they knew nothing. And at one point I realized, I was like, this is not about us. This is, you're not dealing with us. And it just dawned on me that they were merely using the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to project their own uh, feelings, their own passions. A colleague of mine, Egal Ram, called it a Disneyland of hate. So the Catholics and the Protestants signed the Good Friday Agreement, so supposedly they're friends now, but they still hate each other. So their way of channeling those hatreds is through the Israeli-Palestinian identities and conflict. This is how they can play their passions. They can play the hatred, which is not a legitimate emotion now. And they can do it in a Disneyland of hate. Disneyland meaning it's safe. They no longer suffer the repercussions, but it's still a Disneyland of hate. They can express those intense feelings of hate through our conflict while knowing nothing about it. A similar experience happened to me in South Africa. I met with young people in universities in South Africa who were deeply committed to fighting apartheid Israel. Now, I'm sure those of you who visited South Africa know that the whole story of rainbow nation post apartheid is a myth. Uh, apartheid continues in all but name with the deep problems of illiteracy and inequality and poverty. Now, those are deep seated issues that require a lot of drudge work. And I realized that for the young people, they were essentially robbed of the glory of fighting apartheid, which their parents had. Uh, so they still want that glory. How can they have that glory? The glory will be fighting against apartheid Israel, which they've never been, they know nothing about. Uh, and this way they can avoid looking in their backyard and dealing with the multitude of problems of inequality and poverty and infrastructure, and just kind of, again, through this Disneyland of hate, uh, partake in the glory of fighting apartheid, but actually do none of the work. And I think a very similar process is now taking place in America. I think America 
something is going in America and we can have a separate discussion about that. But in many ways, America is working its own issues through the Israel-Palestinian lens. But it's actually about America. It's not about us. Um, I have a talk that I'm giving uh, more and more frequently now called Arab Zionism and Western anti-Zionism in which I talk about even the growing uh, difference between how the Arab world and parts of the Arab world are beginning to embrace Israel as an indigenous legitimate presence uh, in tandem with the rise of virulent Western anti-Zionism. This emphasizes even more the extent to which the American discourse about Israel is not about Israel. To the extent that it ever was about Israel, now, it's definitely not. I think it's very clear that at this moment, the discourse in America about Israel, about the Israeli-Palestinian issue has nothing to do with Israel, which is why you can speak about colorism, even though you only need to be in Israel to see that skin tone is clearly not an issue. This is why you can speak about Jews as white supremacists. Uh, I mean, if there can be a more removed concept, uh, this is why at the moment of greater normalization and peace in the Middle East, you become more anti-Israel. The only way that all these phenomena could be explained is, is by an under, understanding that this is not about Israel. And this is very much about America. People are projecting American issues, American cleavages by kind of uh, uh, taking, uh, buying a ticket for this Disneyland of hate. They can express these very strong emotions of hatred uh, through this safe mechanism of the Israeli-Palestinian issue. In the essay, I call it a neo-colonial uh, attitude because basically, uh, Westerners, and especially at this point, Americans, are again looking at our conflict that has its own reasons uh, through their lens, and they're judging it through their lens. And that is a very much a neocolonial attitude, because rather than dealing with the people themselves, with Arabs and Jews, as they express themselves, as they discuss the reasons for their conflict, you have Westerners imposing their worldview, their issues of American legacy with racism and white and black, imposing all these prisms on our conflict. Uh, I describe it, I mean, classically as a square peg and a round hole. It makes no sense. It clearly provides no insight. And of course, it brings us no closer to resolution. Uh, and I think. Uh, we'll hear now about some more practical elements, how to address it. But for me, the first thing is just to call it out, to call it out for this neocolonial attitude, to call it out for the fact that it has nothing to do with Israel. Uh, I have a very wise friend that sometimes when people speak passionately about something, she stops them and she says, now tell me what it's really about. Tell me what your real problem is. Uh, and I think that is in many ways the first response. When people appear to be too passionate about the issue, but also equally ignorant, I think this is the time to tell us, now tell us what the real problem is. And I think increasingly the answer to that question is that the real problem has to do with domestic issues, whether in America or in Europe or more broadly in the West, and literally have nothing to do with Israel. Thank you. Thanks, Sainat. Leah, I'm going to turn it over to you and hopefully uh, have you also inject the note of like what happens when you also have a profit motive um, as one of the many motives, because you're you're also talking about a for-profit industry. But thank Leah, take it away. Oh, I am. I am. Thank you, Felicia. I just very briefly want to uh, thank Sapir and my Maimonides Fund and the Jewish Funders Network for inviting me to participate in this panel. And to our distinguished panelists, Inat and Rabbi Mike, Felicia, thank you. It's a pleasure to share this virtual stage with all of you. Where do I begin? Um, so I will admit, I'm gonna actually start with a story. So Inat, I have to apologize ahead of time. I didn't get a chance to read your article until a couple of weeks ago, because if you know, you've seen what's happening in the media, we're, we're a little busy recently. Um, and when I read your, your article, I was stunned because 
I don't think I've ever read an article where I actually agreed with every single point and every single point that you outlined is playing itself out in real time in the media. I mean, that that's 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 what I found so shocking because I see it, but I I could never have articulated it in the way that you did in your article. I mean, salient points, and and I could come here and give a million examples of what we're seeing in Spanish, but I want to actually point out something that happened in English right at the beginning of the main conflict that it explains perfectly, it frames perfectly everything that you say in that article. And I don't know if all of you had a chance uh, to see Noah Trevor's uh, basically eight minute monologue on the conflict. And everything that you laid out in your article is right there. I mean, it's right there. The, the video, by the way, has more than 6 million views alone on YouTube. Um, and I, I just wanna highlight the points here with, without um, repeating the words that you use, but the neocolonialism is there, the colorism is there, the placard strategy is there. It's all there and, and it's not just a one-off. What Noah Trevor did is actually something we started to see prior to May in, in the media. Um, but I wanna point this out because I think it's so important that sometimes we don't see through the lines um, of what's really happening in the media. And, and this Noah Trevor video is so succinct with everything that you you laid out in your article. So he begins, and I would just wanna go by this really briefly, but it's so important. Um, something we saw a lot in May, um, which is also totally a disproportionate way of looking at the conflict is comparing the number of dead. And that's how he starts his article. We're seeing this across the board in multiple languages where they're saying, well, the conflict can't be fair. Or it's not a fair fight if only two died on the Israeli side and 200 are dead on the Palestinian side. And then he goes on to say that it's not a fair fight. And if one side has more power than the other side, should that the powerful side retaliate? And while he's giving this monologue, he has the Black Lives Matter placard behind him, whether on purpose or not, um, as he's giving this monologue. And then he goes to share a story about his childhood and his mother from South Africa. As a prominent journalist, and per, like person of color. And all of this, whether we realize or not, and, and he goes on and on, and I'm not going to spend my valuable few minutes, you know, reliving this, uh, this not uh, fabulous video monologue. But he ends by saying about the question, the main question is about power. And that feeds directly into the neocolonialism, you know, that you're speaking about. Um, and I want to, I want to actually say something else to, to just illustrate how on, on the mark you are. So off the record, Fuente Latina has just done 14 focus groups um, across the United States of uh, registered independents and Democrats between the ages of 18 and 35. And the number one dominant lens on Israel for these groups, particularly African-Americans, Latinos, Asian-Americans, Pacific Islanders, is the neocolonial lens. It is distorting everything about Israel and the conflict. It dominates everything about Israel and the conflict. And then the colorism, the colorism of what's happening right now in the United States is absolutely feeding into this distortion. Um, in our focus groups, anecdotally, I can say that, that it was about color. It was about, it was about who was brown and who was white. And Jews are thought to have white privilege, we are outward white looking. Um, and there isn't an, an acknowledgement that we too are a diverse group. Um, and those lenses really dominate what we see in the media framing and, and the more important, the trickle down effect of public opinion on the ground, whether it's through digital media, through social media, and it's, it's a problem. Um, I do wanna say, and I think I only have a few minutes left, I do wanna say that there is a grave danger in applying this Western lens in media coverage, um, particularly to the conflict. But I will also play devil's advocate and particularly for media professionals like myself that work exclusively in the non-Jewish media space. It's also a tool for us because as Anat said, and I can't repeat it enough, your average American does not know anything about the conflict and also they don't care. And when we have to make something relevant to an audience that doesn't care about our issues, sometimes we need to put that lens on stories, 
which I can say for a fact that I do almost every single day. And I'll give a prime example. Um, we to, to, to illustrate the danger of Hamas terrorist tunnels in Gaza, we brought once to Israel prior COVID, uh, a very prominent journalist, Latino journalist from LA. And we took him to go see the tunnels and he didn't understand what they were. Didn't understand the context of what they were. But when we framed it in the context of Chapo Guzman, the drug lord, who had built an, an elaborate tunnel system under his mansion in Mexico City to be able to escape the authorities, then it made headline news. So the applying the Western lens is a danger, but it is also a tool. Um, and I think it can't be discarded as, as an absolute. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Leah. Mike, we're gonna turn it to you. And all this talk about colonialism brings us right back to the Academy. So um, we're really eager to hear your perspective on this. Great, thank you so much. And uh, just as Leah said, thank you so much for the invitation and to be um, with such great and thoughtful panelists um, is a great pleasure and a big honor. Um, Einat, I, I knew of you, I'd seen some pieces of you throughout the years, but when I read your piece in Sapir, it just blew me away. Um, and then spent a great deal more time reading your stuff and watching on YouTube. I think you have a tremendous amount to offer all of us. So thank you for those contributions. Uh, I wanna try to focus on three pieces of how this relates to campus. Um, if we have time, there's a fourth, but we, I can save that for later as well. Um, the first thing I wanna pick up on is, I, I love the terminology that you used of the Disneyland of hate and, and you gave it in the name of your colleague who shared it with you. I think it's such a powerful paradigm that captures one of the things that is going on for young people. And I think you talked about it in the sense of like people are looking for the glory of the fight. They may not have civil rights from the 60s or anti-apartheid of the 80s. I think that is true. I think that young Jews in America are suffering with a, a crisis of meaning and purpose. And so they are dying to find a place where they can uh, live out that fight and that battle. But I also think there's another piece that's really going on on campus. And it, it'll lead also into my second and third point as well. But part of what's happening on campus and why young people are so susceptible to what you call the Disneyland of hate is not just social or political, it's also developmental. And it's so helpful to get regrounded in the notion that part of the developmental stage of people who are between 18 and 25 years old is that their prefrontal cortexes are not fully formed. And, and the same things that make college students more likely to seek out thrilling behavior and risk-taking, binge drinking, hookup culture, uh, cutting class, all of the experimentation that happens in college that all of us who are parents pay for, um, this also leads to thinking that tends to think in black and white about heroes and villains. Um, some of the tensions that exist between parents and their college age students are motivated by this same dynamic where they're looking for, are my parents the hero of my story or the villain of my story? And so it's, it is an age where there's a huge amount of susceptibility to this kind of thinking. And it fits in very much with this concept of the Disneyland of hate. The reason I say this is not to say so, so we don't have to worry about it, but I think it one of the things I found over the years is that people who are on the ground often have a different approach to trying to, to work with these populations than the adult community does. And I think that what happens is there's a, like almost a parallax, like a, a, a bending of light that obscures our ability to view what's really going on. I think this is an important thing that before we judge, before we see young people as broken, um, this is a lens that will help us understand them and I think understand the campus climate. I, I, was, I also wanted to just add one other piece to this, which is campus is often more complicated than it seems in the media. Um, and so you hear these stories about how crazy it is and how unsafe it is. And when you really talk to students um, on campuses like Penn, which was a very moderate campus, but even when you talk to students on the campuses that are notoriously not moderate, the average rank and file Jew does not feel this stuff. Um, it's the people who are fighting for Israel who are suffering this burnout. And so this doesn't mean it's not important, but those are important lenses if we wanna see it in a clear headed way. The second piece that I wanted to talk about 
is what I wanted to call proximity relationships and narratives. Um, I think that this is a great frame for how we talk about Israel and how we combat the dynamics that you lay out and not in your piece. And I wanna share a story about it, this. Um, years ago at Penn Hillel, we led a trip to Agahozu Shalom Youth Village in Rwanda. And we wanted there to be real ethnic and religious diversity on the trip. And so we brought a, an amazing young woman and we had done some vetting, but it turns out that she showed up on the trip wearing a necklace of Israel covered in a Palestinian flag. And it was amazing to watch how Jewish students spoke to her. We landed you know, Friday afternoon, we got to the youth village for Shabbat. Shabbat was spent talking with this young woman about how that necklace made these students feel. And she was not trying to um, hurt anyone's feelings. She was not even trying to be such an activist. It was a kind of simple virtue signaling for her, her simplistic Disneyland version of this. So she took it off. We, no one asked her to, but she took it off. What's amazing is that time, because she got so close to so many Jewish students, so then she did other interfaith programs. She did a Hebrew Arabic program that we offered. Um, and when BDS broke out on Penn's campus, she was actually the president of Penn for Palestine. This is a precursor to Penn's chapter of Students for Justice in Palestine. And this young woman actually stormed into my office um, and said, I just resigned from Penn for Palestine because I don't want to embrace BDS or anti-normalization tactics because everywhere I go, I am the token Muslim and I'm the token Pakistani. And this is now I understand why Jews need a homeland because everywhere Jews go, they represent all Jews and are tokenized in this way. And I don't love the Israeli government and I don't love the policies but the answer is not to delegitimize the existence of a Jewish state. And she actually ended up going to study abroad at the Technion in her junior year. What's amazing about this is I think it, it is a, it's a simple story that tells us what we already know, that you can't really change people's opinions through facts and figures, but it's really much more about proximity, relationships, and narratives. When this young woman got to know Jews, when she got to know about people's families, all of a sudden it went from the Disneyland version to complexity. And I think that this is one of the greatest tools that we have is to move people from simplicity to complexity and to activate their empathy, which will slow down their reactiveness and how they respond to these issues. Um, and I think that there's tons of research from people like Fern Oppenheim that show that understanding Israelis is a much easier mountain to climb than understanding Israel. So uh, I'm, I wanna be mindful of time. I'm gonna make my last point very briefly, which is just that campus is a bubble and it's not real life. And I think it's really hard for adults, even for me at 45, um, to transpose between the two. We think in terms of, of firm identity, but young students are, have fluid identities. They're trying things out. And I think that when we misunderstand campus, we, we respond in the wrong ways and sometimes we over respond. And so the main piece that I wanted to hit here is that the approach I think is relational and educational, not advocacy. Ironically, I think there actually does need to be advocacy, but I think the benefit of having strong advocates on campus is that some of the more mainstream organizations can respond as relational educators because again, if someone's just trying something out and they're ignorant or they don't know, or they're just doing what's in fashion, being called out for that, it shuts them down. But if you invite them in, um, like we did with this young woman, I think that there are different opportunities. And I also just wanna highlight that we are living in a moment where young people have incredible distrust of adults, of gatekeepers and of institutional powers. So every time the Jewish community positions themselves against young people, I think we may succeed in quieting them in the moment, but we're gonna lose our ability to influence them. And because their identities are so fluid, um, we're missing out on this incredible opportunity to, to influence them in all these positive ways. Thank you. So uh, again, thank you for all these comments and reflections. Um, I, one of the things that I found and I think is fascinating and is a bit of a ray of hope is that young people are shaping the responses and in many ways, the most effective responses that we're seeing at the moment. 
Uh, we're seeing young people, again, it's still at the margins, but it's gaining traction. Uh, we're seeing young people on campus uh, reclaim the Zionist identity. Because I think what young people realized on campus is that anti-Zionism and this whole uh, conversation around Israel, not really a conversation, more shouting, uh, is, is a form of bullying. And therefore it responds to the dynamic of bullying, uh, which means that the more you try to pacify the bully, uh, the more they're going to be a bully. Uh, and I think that's what we've seen over the years. And I think that's what a lot of young Jews have seen that if you try to pacify the bully by saying, look, I'm against Israel's government and I too hate this and really look, I'm not with Israel. What they found is that the bully only demanded more of their lunch money. Um, and often the most effective response to bullying is to stand up to it. Uh, is to basically say, I'm done. You know, I'm, you're not getting any more of my lunch money. Uh, and the way that young Jews are doing that is by reclaiming Zionism as a confident Jewish identity, not as a movement to create Israel, obviously, not as a movement even to support Israel, even though they do. It's a movement that basically it's a way to say to other people, you can't bully me and you can't scare me because I'm already owning and reclaiming uh, this Zionist identity. It's a bit like the slut walks, you know, reclaiming an identity so that you can't be shamed anymore. Uh, and they're calling themselves the new Zionist Congress. And I know some of you are involved with them and uh, Zionists. And Zionism is becoming the mark of a confident Jewish identity that resists bullying. Uh, and this is why I've come to the conclusion that actually the best response to this wave of anti-Zionism, which I think by now, if any of us had any questions many years ago, I think by now it's obviously shown itself to be merely the, the respectable mask of anti-Semitism, that the most successful response to anti-Zionism is just more Zionism, uh, is basically when young Jews are reclaiming that, uh, this is when the bullying stops because you're not gonna, bu gonna bully someone who can't be shamed by their identity. Uh, and I think a lot of the responses are found in really regaining that confident Jewish identity that can stand up to bullying. And I think then that can play a lot into the things you said. Then Jews can have uh, relations that ultimately have impact because they're confident and they're proud of their identity. They're able to go to the media. Um, and at least for me, that's what I've recently seen as a very effective response to this form of bullying. Because once you understand that it's not a conversation, it's not people trying to make world peace, it's really a form of bullying, then I think the response becomes much clearer. So um, it's, if it's okay, I would love to jump in. Um, I, and I think that there's some beautiful and important pieces there. And I think that the, the naming it as bullying in some way helps bring about the relationship and narrative piece that it humanizes the face of the, of the Jewish student who feels bullied. But I do also wanna push back because I, what I, again, I've been off campus for, for eight months now. But I saw a different dynamic than what you're describing, or that what you're describing is, is happening in one, um, on one level, but not necessarily across the board. I think when you talk about reclaiming Zionism and the Jewish confidence, I see that among uh, Orthodox students, modern Orthodox students, and you'd see that among a small subset of people who are very much already in the camp of loving Israel. But the vast majority of like, the population of Jews, I see something totally different, which is there, it, I see, in other words, this might be seven or 8% of Jews on a normal campus. And, and you might see seven or 8% of Jews on campus who are anti-Zionist, but the vast silent majority actually is hiding. Uh, sometimes they don't care. Sometimes they're embarrassed. Sometimes they have no opinion. And so they don't want to claim the Zionist word and they don't want to fight. Um, and and this, the final thing I would want to add is I, I agree with you that we that it's that the response to a bully is to fight, but this again I think goes to some of the skewing of what's happening on campus, which is um, I think that we have to know when to fight, 
and when fighting actually just pours gasoline on it. So for example, at Penn, there were 13 students out of 10,000 who were actively leading the BDS revolution. And Penn Hillel had about 350 students actively involved in pro-Israel activities. And thank God we had a, like a political guru on our board, but he said in politics, the rule is you never punch down. So if we started yelling that Israel's not an apartheid state, um, we would actually help create that dichotomy in people's minds because no one was hearing these 13 students. That's different than on other campuses where it really is a, a much larger majority of students. But I think that we just can't fall into the trap. I mean, we are very well wired as Jews to respond to the crisis narrative. And, um, and just to be able to pause and to understand when, are, when do we have to fight and when should we actually just outflank, which is, I think you gave that hint, Einat, which is more Zionism. So instead of investing in the fight, you outflank them by just investing in more positive education connection to Israel. So I'd also, I'd also like to respond. Um, and um, and Mike, so much of what you said very much resonates in, in terms of how we need to be speaking to non-Jewish audiences. I, I really want to make that distinction because I'm not the 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 frame that you laid out is is really the, the non-Jewish media frame. Um, it's not that all all non-Jewish media is anti-Semitic or anti-Zionist. Um, you know, in the soundbite era and in COVID and the pandemic, literally changed media overnight. Um, the war of ideas and opinions are being fought on the battlefield of social media platforms. I mean, it's, it's, all, it's all really upside down over the last two years. But what I can tell you with, with certainty is that what you're explaining in terms of the Zionism is not filtering to the media. It is not at all. We are at a critical crossroads with regard to Israel and Zionism and anti-Semitism and the non-Jewish media because we are all speaking in an echo chamber. None of this conversation, which is incredible that we're having right now, even hits like the lowest level of non-Jewish media. They don't know what Zionism is. They don't care what Zionism is. They don't understand the context of Zionism. And when they hear Zionism with that lens, that neo-colonial lens that you described in the colorism lens, it's all about the villain and the hero. Um, and what we saw happen in May is, is what they call in communications, the, the underdog effect of social media, where, where the Palestinian side is thought to be the underdog, but yet social media gave them an even playing ground. To the, so much so to the point right now that even in the, in the research that we're doing, Hamas is seen, their rocket attacks are seen as retaliatory or defensive because Israel is thought to have all that power. So I think we also need to understand that I, I do believe that the first, the first layer of what we need to do is an empower our youth and empower those that want to speak up and out, more importantly, about these issues. But I think, um, and, and um, this also answers a question that just popped up. What we found is no one understands what Zionism is. And more importantly, nobody understands the connection between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. And if we want to win the war of ideas outside of our bubble, we have to take control of our narrative, which currently we do not have in any language in media. We do not have a media outlet that speaks to non-Jews. We don't have the state-funded media that Russia today have, or that Al Jazeera have, or that Iran has. Um, that are pumping billions and billions of media dollars to win hearts and minds that we, we're, we're, we're just not even scratching the surface of. Um, and, and now the playing field has been absolutely like leveled as of May. We need to take control of our narrative, but we also need to adapt our narrative to the current lens of the non-Jews. So just and not before you respond, because I imagine you have what to say about that. Um, let's just remind uh, ourselves that we're speaking to an audience of funders, so we can be really concrete about what you think are strategies that are that are useful and effective. And and Mike, I think your story of the woman on the trip to Rwanda is a very powerful story. And and Leah, you're teaching us to speak in stories anyway, right? So, what are some examples of things that we could do that really can turn these things around? And maybe, and not to, we can ask you, there was a question that came in through the Q&A 
um, just about this word Zionism at all. A bunch of us, a bunch of funders were on a call not that long ago where we were advised by a, a very well-known political strategist to don't use the word Zionism ever again. It just polls really badly. So you can imagine that gets a lot of people's backs up. Tell us, what do you, what do you think about that? So assuming it's the same pollster from the last decade ago, uh, I still have the same response. Uh, that is terrible advice. Mm -hmm. It's the advice of a pollster. It's not the advice of, I say, someone who understands that at the end of the day, people shape the future. Uh, I wrote actually in response to that pollster a few years ago, uh, who gave that advice, I uh, wrote a piece talking about the similarities between Zionism and feminism as two enlightenment movement of liberation that called for equality and self-determination of previously dispossessed people and how anti-feminism and anti-Zionism are also very similar in that they reflect the desire of ancient power structures to uh, basically go back to the status quo ante. Uh, when we give up the, the Zionist identity, when we give up the word Zionism, we achieve nothing and we lose a lot. Uh, think of it basically as uh, forfeiting ground. This is literally giving our lunch money. This is playing into the bullies. The bullies are not going to stop when we're going to stop saying that we're Zionist. They are just gonna make sure that whatever is the next word we adopt or the next identity becomes equally illegitimate and toxic. Because the word Zionism became toxic, not by some kind of innocent process, right? Those who uh, are anti-Zionist will say, oh, Zionism is white supremacism and racism and colonialism because that's just what it is. But if you look into it, and this is the essence of the placard strategy, uh, Zionism has purposefully been made through a campaign that by now is at least 50 years old, going back to the Soviet era, even before. It's a campaign to make Zionism into a toxic word uh, because you can no longer be an openly anti-Semitic. So we've had this campaign uh, going on. This is not an innocent process. Um, people will say that Zionism has become toxic because Israel is bad. If this were true, then the word Israel would have been worse than the word Zionism, right? Because Zionism could have retained this pristine identity as a liberation movement, but then people would just say, but Israel ruined this beautiful, pristine idea. What you have is the opposite. Israel is less toxic as a word than Zionism. And why is that? Because those who have targeted Zionism to make it into this evil idea, I believe they understand what is the core of the Jews' power today. At the core of Jewish power today is not the Israeli military and not even the Israeli state. It is the people who believe in the importance of Jewish self-determination. Without those people, there's no military and there's no state. So, if you want to bring the Jewish people down, you go directly to their secret source of power, to their belief in Zionism, to their desire for self-determination and self-possession. If you can bring that down, if you can drive the wedge between Jews and Zionism, if you can get Jews and even Israelis to feel uncomfortable about their power, this is how you bring them down. So this is not an innocent process. And when you give into that, we are playing into bringing our power down. And I can say there's nothing good on the other end of Jews not having power. That was your second issue. Um, right. Yes. Right. So this, this is critical. Uh, and that's why I believe that those young Jews who are reclaiming Zionism get it. Now, you're absolutely right. They're the minority. But they're a minority that represents what I believe is the way forward. Because at the end of the day, people, you could say, have two feelings. Empathy towards the downtrodden, empathy to the underdog. But people are also deeply attracted to success and confidence. Uh, those are also very fundamental human traits. We uh, we go to confidence, we go to success. So Palestinians have 
successfully established themselves, despite this, again, have, having no connection to reality as the underdog in the conflict. They represent the dominant Arab uh, region, but fine. They've established themselves as the underdog. So they constantly seek empathy. But at the end of the day, all that empathy doesn't translate into anything because they are a people whose goal is destructive. It's not constructive. They're not looking to build anything. Zionism operated for much of its history without a lot of empathy, but because it's about confidence, it's about success, it's been able to use the much less empathy we got to have far greater achievements because the goal is construction. So for me, the projection of confidence, the projection of success, I know today people talk about privilege and whatever, but it's because everyone wants to have privilege. I mean, people are angry that one side has it and another doesn't, but the ideal is for everyone ha to have it. The ideal is not for everyone to be a victim or an underdog. The ideal is for everyone to have privilege, to have success. So I believe that it is a long-term, far more effective strategy. Be confident, take ownership of uh, identity, don't give any lunch money to the bullies, be a Zionist, and you'll see that people will, at the end, in my belief, will uh, take a step back because when you tell them, I'm a Zionist, what of it? These young people that I talk to, they say, people step back because, and by the way, it's not Orthodox Jews. Amazingly, it's Jews from the former Soviet Union who have an instinctive sense of what they're fighting. They, they see this anti-Zionism as exactly what they saw in the Soviet Union. It's Jews of Mizrahi background who instinctively have a sense of peoplehood. Uh, so it's actually very interesting. They're coming from backgrounds that at this moment in time are less susceptible to this bullying and their confidence is very natural. I, um, I'm glad that you added at the end what you added, because I think it's true that I maybe was being Ashkin normative in the way that I was thinking about but I think it's true, former Soviet Union Jews and Mizrahi Jews have a different identity construct that plays differently. Um, I wanna say two things, I think. One is, um, Inad, I hope that you're not mad at me after this panel, but um, I actually think that the piece that you said about confidence and, and attraction to power does not ring true to me. Um, I think that there's a cultural moment where, um, people who are perceived to have power who then claim that power are villainized in profound ways. And again, more of the kind of Ashkenormative normative Jews on campus. Um, I've watched them continually um, choose to diminish their power and confidence. Um, and so I, it just doesn't ring true, but I also think that you're, you're Israeli, I'm a good Galuti diaspora Jew. So there's some of this, <laughs> I, wanna, I wanna pivot for one sec and say, both the question you asked Felicia and the questions that were in the chat, I think that part of the answer that I see is based on work of John McKnight and John Kretzman, who created something called asset-based community development theory. And what that means is they did all this research that shows when you're trying to change community and culture, if you begin with deficiencies and problems, and how do we fix the problems, that it ends up building very big institutions that disempower people and in almost every situation, inner city, developing world, whatever it is, may actually made those problems worse. And what they propose instead is to begin by building on assets rather than trying to fix deficiencies. And that actually has a tremendous uh, change uh, possibility and brings people together. So I think that part of the answer here is it's not to battle the problem of anti-Israel. It's not to battle the problem of anti-Semitism. It's not to battle um, the brokenness of these colonial narratives. I think that we have to double down on the amazing parts of Judaism and Jewish community, the amazing people that are in our sphere, the amazing partnerships and connections we have. And if you can build more, more Judaism, more community, more connectivity, more sense of destiny being tied with the Jewish people, it opens up these possibilities, which I think are the answer to how we change culture on campus, how we prepare leaders, and how we support the majority, which is most campuses offer either hookah and falafel as like Jewish identity or Israeli expressions of Jewish identity or um, crisis and Israel advocacy. 
And there's so much more, there's so many more ways to connect people to Judaism and to the people of Israel and to the state of Israel than just those poles. And so I think if we, if, if we can fight our nature, which is to succumb to crisis narratives, and we instead try to build on what we have, things reveal themselves and opportunities. And again, there are moments to fight for sure. I'm not afraid of that. And I think we need it. But I think that sometimes it's such an, it's so much easier to figure out how to fix the problem than it is to build on what's working. Amen. Uh, in, in terms of what you're saying, it couldn't ring more true uh, in the media sphere. And, and Inet, I also don't want you to hate me after this panel, but um, what, what I do want to say is, is just because media audiences or journalists don't know what Zionism is, doesn't mean that we shouldn't explain it to them and provide them a context with them. And what we're finding in the media, what really works, which seems so simple, but somewhere along the line we forgot, is our own shared experiences as Jews and as Israelis in a way that makes sense to them. Um, whether it's coloring a little bit with the lens that distorts Israel and, and Jews, but that makes sense to a non-Jewish media audience. We are, we've always been in crisis mode. Mike, I can't remember a time in 16 years in media, I haven't been in crisis mode. And, and working in crisis mode has not gotten us anywhere or any further. In fact, it's pushed us back. And I agree wholeheartedly with you that when I, when I say take over our own narrative and take over our own star storytelling, what I'm saying is let's stop being on the defensive and let's start just telling our stories. Let's, let's go out and explain ourselves and what we believe in and what we stand for to non-Jewish audiences instead of trying to constantly defend. I think that non-Jewish audiences understand, will understand what Zionism is when they have the context and, and the, the proper knowledge of what it is and won't see it as something that's negative in the same way that many don't see Israel as being negative. But it requires us to do not hasbara, to empower our youth, to, to do research to understand what can we be doing. It, it's storytelling is an art, just, 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 like, just like any other profession. And, and we have to, we have to empower our youth and our leaders. We have to put more women on camera. We have to put more Jews of color on camera. We have the, the, the people that we're speaking to have to reflect those, the audiences that we're trying to engage. There's, there's a lot that we can do. And, and this is really just the starting point, but at least now we know what we need to be doing better moving forward. We are definitely out of time. We knew um, that this conversation could go on for a really long time. And I have to say, sort of love the, the comment, oh, and Inata, I hope you don't hate me for saying this. This is actually what we're here to do at Sapir and as a Jewish people, I think, is to disagree with each other. One of the things that I think is especially um, really intentional at Sapir is that we're trying to bring different people with different perspectives from different parts of the community together to interact with each other. So Mike, I think your perspective of someone who's who's been on campus and lived with young people um, is incredibly powerful. And Leia, your perspective across the media landscape and, and with the different types of people than most of us usually interact with has also been really powerful. Um, definitely, this is also a great commercial for the second issue of Sapir, which has many articles about Jewish discomfort. Thank you. Um, that's the first one. Here's the second one um, about power. Many articles about the Jewish discomfort with power and how we have to just overcome that. Um, uh, the third issue that's coming out has a great piece on this topic of uh, Russian-speaking Jews um, and their perspective on this by Isabella Tavarovsky, who's written many good pieces for Tablet about this. Um, and then many, uh, many issues about uh, many articles about con about um, text and the Jewish narrative and the Jewish story and the need to be Jewishly educated as a form of, you know, Mike, as you said, outflanking. Um, like, why are we why are we engaging with the with the bullies on their terms instead of on ours? So, I want to thank all of you, and not thank you, uh, Mike and Leah, really for being with us today and for your contributions across the board to Jewish communal life and to Israel. Tomorrow, you want to close us out? Thank you. Yeah, I just want to echo those thank yous and thank you, Felicia, for moderating this, and thank you for the partnership. 
um, of putting this all together, you and your colleagues. Um, thank you, Anat and Mike and Leah. And I wanted to also give another plug. I put the form to receive your free copy of the upcoming Sapir Journal. Um, I put the form uh, link in the chat. So please take advantage of that. This is just like Felicia started um, with her starting comments saying this is a start of a conversation that we want to really continue on at, throughout JFN in our different programs and in other places. So please continue uh, reading and speaking and continuing these conversations with us. So thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful day.